Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm, as Chris said, sorry, I just need to get rid of the chat window. There we go. As Chris said, my name's Matt Boyd and I'm working on a master's at the University of Sydney. Um, today I'm in the inner north of Melbourne on the land of the Wandery people and I acknowledge them as traditional owners. Um, I guess some of the work today I'll be presenting is based on interpretation of data collected by government and industry in the Otway Basin over several decades in uh, Victoria and South Australia and I acknowledge the traditional owners of those lands. So I'm researching the interaction between tectonics and stratigraphy in early rift basin sequences using source to sink landscape evolution modeling software badlands. And for the last several months, I've been working on the design of experiments methods um, using the Doigen tools that the Sydney Informatics Hub put together to calibrate my experiments and observations. And um, this seminar presents that work. So a couple of acknowledgements here just um, to the to uh, the uh, Doigen, guys who put Doigen together at the Sydney Informatics Hub. Um, Sebastian Hahn and Henry Leidek uh, worked extensively on that project. Uh, Badlands was developed as part of the Basin Genesis Hub, which finished up a couple of years ago. Uh, and a lot of the data for one of the experiments that I'm going to show here was supplied by the Geological Survey of Victoria as part of the Victorian Gas Program, which ran between 2017 and 2020. And um, my Thanks to my supervisors, Tristan Zoll and Sarah Moran. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to present today uh, Jupyter Notes, uh, some screenshots from Jupyter Notebooks. Um, that the whole thing's available on request. Um, just give me an email. There's a PIP version of the tool set that I've put together. Uh, there's an updated Docker container. Um, so I'm, I'll show some examples of the code used through throughout this seminar. Um, I've attempted to make the code as efficient and sort of user friendly as possible. So where is where possible, the experiment parameters are taken directly from the Badlands configurations uh, and the experiment configuration part files. And I also make extensive use of the Python multiprocessing module where possible. Um, all of this is is built into the, the PIP package. So it's it's don't need to pay too much attention to learning how to use those tools. Uh, so the um, I'll run through how I've integrated Doigen and Badlands. Hopefully I'll be able to convince you that it's something we should be doing more often and demonstrate that the tools I've put together are a good start on evaluating the outputs from run, when we run multiple experiments. I'll explain how Doigen works. Get my little laser pointer. I'll explain how Doigen works and some key concepts that you should understand before using it. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of Badlands. Um, there's probably a few people here who haven't or haven't used it before, aren't that familiar with it. Uh, and then I'll show two examples, uh, workflows and the results. The first one uses a standard library Badlands example. So it's just in the Badlands workshop and that's available on GitHub. And the second one is the experiments that I'm working on to evaluate the SINRIF sequence in the Otway Basin, where I demonstrate how some simple curve matching Python modules can be used to identify the best of our sets of experiments. With luck, I'll be able to convince anyone working with Badlands that the analysis that a DOE approach enables is a benefit in a lot of scenarios. So just first up, a, a really quick overview of what Badlands is. It's a source to sync landscape evaluation model and it's implemented in Python. It uses empirical equations. So this is just an example of, of one of the key equations that's used in here. To calculate the change in the height of the slope on each part of a surface, surface representing a landscape. Um, so it's important to mention that Bands, Badlands doesn't model sediment transport using grain size or lithology properties. It just changes the shape of that surface using these equations. Um, the equations are based on observations and, and uh, real world experiments. So rainfall, drainage patterns, the volume of the surface that's transited along, the volume of surface that's transported along those various pathways, those are the sorts of things that are kept track of in Badlands. For the workflows that we're looking at today, I'm going to be digging into the transport and environment variables. So on the left here, 
We've got just a basic block model. And these are the key parameters that we're looking at today, but they're also key parameters that, that are used in Badlands. So we have a precipitation, this basic sort of erosion variable for um, a landscape, these M and N properties, which affect the uh, transport erosion and transport along slopes and across through the landscape as well, um, and this tech and some a couple of different tectonic displacement scenarios. These are the the things that create the accommodation that we're evaluating. Um, while it was running, you probably saw a little bit of these animations about how um, Badlands works, and these are just the, some typical outputs from from Badlands. So what's design of experiments and why am I using it? It's essentially to op used to optimize parameter variations. It's used a lot in drug trials, material materials analysis. Um, if you're in the petroleum space, it's used in reservoir modeling. It can be used to design tests on physical objects or processes, varying concentrations, temperature, pressure, evaluating those against the result that you want or expect. Here we apply it to a model of a system with the parameters distributed in a statistically useful way to test the effect of varying those parameters. This has benefits over an intuitive distribution of parameter variations and a manual interpretation of results. So this will come across as probably really simple, but I, it's a key concept I don't really want to get across here to start. So there are two key concepts I want to introduce early and spend a little time on here. The dots represent a set of parameters that we know everything about. So we're looking for the best way to des describe this set of parameters with a couple of measures. So the first thing we're looking at is orthogonality. Orthogonality is telling us if we've sampled a data set or a parameter space enough to cover all of the potential variations. So in this, this case, we're looking at our red sample set where we don't sample all of the potential colors. So if we, if we want to be able to describe our sample set appropriately, this, this sort of, this is a low orthogonal relationship. So the other thing that we, we want to talk about is balance. So uh, here we've sampled a larger part of our data set, but we've oversampled these orange dots. So while we're a, we're, we're a high orthogonality on this data set, so a high, we've covered all of the data points, we have this low balance. So a statistical analysis of these, of just of these results would skew our results in a, in a particular direction. So a, we can sample all these colors so they're evenly orthogonal and balanced. So we've got, if we sample four points, we cover all of those things. And that's that's what we're aiming for. There's a, another scenario where we can sample a larger data set where we're still orthogonal and balanced, but we're inefficient. We're doing more work than we need to do. So this is just one of the, the a key concept that we needed to cover um, quite early on. And I'll move on to the next slide where we go into a lot more detail. So in a design of experiments, we have these things called parameters and levels. So our parameters are our variables and our levels are the number of variations that each of those levels have. So in a four parameter, four level design where we are looking at all possible combinations. So an all possible combination is a full factorial experiment. We would need to run 256 experiments to evaluate all of those combinations. So I'd like to introduce this concept of parameter level pairs. If we just look at an individual set of a set of a, one or two sets of parameters here, say our P and N variables from the previous examples. So we can evaluate all of these parameters with 16. So this is, is kind of like a, a sub full factorial analysis. So this pair combination examines, allows us to examine how those pairs interact with each other. So we can extend this to the rest of the parameter space. So a looking at each of these individual parameter pair levels, we can cover this entire design space with six, six sample sets or parameter pair sets. And all of our unique level pair combinations come out at 96 experiments, experiments which is already you know, much more efficient than this 256 experiments. However, in each of our experiments, 
we're using all of these variables. So all four are present in each of those sets. And we can examine these pairs against each other. So if we push this out a little bit further and we look at how these parameter level pairs are involved, com combined with each other, in each of one of these experiments, we're examining six pair level combinations within one experiment. So if we have a look at this, we're evaluating E1 and P1, P1 and M1, all of these against each other. So this is that, that concept where we're comparing them against each other. So what we're looking at when we're evaluating our balance and our orthogonality on this design of experiments, are these the balance and orthogonality of these parameter level pair combinations. So for example, in this, this, these green boxes here represent 48 experiments. And in those 48 experiments, we examine every possible parameter level pair from this four parameter, four level design. However, it's unbalanced and it's possibly not the most efficient. There may be smaller numbers of a smaller number of uh, uh, a, a smaller design set that is still orthogonal and is still balanced. So there's lots of unique solutions to this. So this is what Doogen does for us. So this is a tool built by the Sydney Informatics Hub. It searches through the parameter space for the optimal number of experiments and the distributed distribution of those parameter level pairs for a design that satisfies this criteria of orthogonality and balance that are also efficient. It produces this plot to show how our evaluations vary as we increase the number of experiments and answers the question about which set of experiment designs will evaluate all of those parameter level pairs without bias. It does have some limitations. So it identifies the parameters that are it's really good at identifying parameters that are, are the primary cause of an effect. And it identifies the effects caused by interactions of two parameters, not necessarily as well as those main or those primary effects. It's not very good at determining complex effects that are the result of combinations of two or more parameters. But I, I counter that by saying by working out those complex effects are probably difficult to do in any case. So I've built some tools to simplify this workflow. The tools have been built to be as intuitive as possible. Um, the model related parameters are taken directly from the Badlands group configuration files. The other inputs are in the simple CSV or text input files. The outputs and the intermediate files are to a HDF5 text and some image files for plots. Uh, I'll move on to our next slide. So this is just a brief summary of the workflow. We, we set up the Doogen experiment, which has an Excel input, Excel files. Uh, we run the Doogen process or Python over the um, that experiment, which outputs this design table, which is just a CSV with our parameter variations in it. Uh, we then generate our Badlands experiment configurations from that CSV, run the Badlands experiments in parallel, generate and extract our calibration data from those Badlands experiments at those locations. And then we use these other tools that Doogen provides to evaluate that experiment data and the effect of those design parameters on our final experiments. Um, and there's uh, there's a couple of other tools. There's another tool that I've built that looks at the similarity between curves to try and dig a little bit deeper into stratigraphy. Um, so I'm just going to run through a really quick example of how this whole thing's come together with this basin experiment design set. So here you can see this is just the basic setup of the of the of this um, Badlands model. Um, the initial surface that's used to start the model uh, is here with these black lines indicating the shoreline position. And we have a varying sea level that goes into this as well. And that's just the sea level curve. These are a, a, just a standard Badlands setup. Um, this is the, the Excel configuration file that's used to build that initial input for Doogen. Uh, we have some parameter types that we set up. So these are continuous or categorical. So our continuous categorical or our continuous 
values have a number of levels. So these are the our parameter levels that we're talking about, a minimum and a maximum. And this include yes or no is just a flag to, to use in, in the DOEGEN process or not. Um, these other factors that are flagged no are used to construct the rest of the Badlands configuration file. All that happens here is that if you have a, a continuous value, the parameter levels are distributed between those values using that number of levels. If you have a categorical value, it's it uses these values in this box over here. So uh, in this case, it's using this categorical value. There are two tectonic event scenarios. So there are sub XML files that are loaded in um, that represent two tectonic scenarios. Uh, so at this stage, we just run the DOEGEN process on this Excel file uh, to produce the output CSV, so our DOEGEN experiments. This is just a, a simple way to run it within um, DOEGEN within the um, our Jupyter Notebook. You just load it, point it to your Excel file, have a couple of parameters about the number of runs that you might want to do, uh, the out path for it, and, and some simple data there. These are the results that we get out from this basin experiment. So you can see here it's recommended this minimum of experiment design of, uh, of 32 experiments. And that is this point in the plot. So you can see that our green line, which is our orthogonality, is nice and high. Uh, it's probably at its close to its maximum, but also that our balance measures are all peaking in this point as well. Um, so in this case, I've chosen the 48 experiment um, designed to run for the rest of the experiment. Uh, and, and it shows what these numbers are as well for those, those measures that we're looking at. Um, these plots here are just a graphical way of describing these balanced parameters that are plotted here. And these are produced for each experiment design set that um, Badlands or that Doigen looks at for, for here. So this is what an unbalanced result would look like if we're just looking at that experiment design. This is what the minimum looks like, and this is what the best looks like. So then we generate and run the Badlands XML configuration files. Uh, this is just a, a really simple process using that code that DOE Badlands DOE toolset that I put together. Uh, we just take the CSV file, tell it where the CSV file is, and it will automatically generate the, um, the XML configuration files, the experiments. Similarly, we have the multiprocessing module where we run these experiments in parallel. Um, depending on your computing power, you need to configure the number of processors and to suit your CPU and RAM. Um, but we only need to point it at the location of the XML, the directory where all those XML files have been uh, built or sent to to load and run those configuration files. So essentially, this just runs all the Badland models in one go. Once those are complete, the next step of the workflow is to extract those results at well locations. Uh, once again, this is following that same process where we we, we just uh, point the um, the, the module at the XML directory to extract so it knows what those models look like. Uh, we also need a well location. So this is just a simple X, XY location model for all of uh, a simple text file with the X and Y locations, somewhere to send the data and somewhere to send our, our final results from there as well. Um, so this will add some extra useful results to those files as well. So this sends it to a, a HDF5 file, which is just a nice thing to look at, a way to store our data. Uh, we then look at how we evaluate the outputs from that well extraction. Uh, we can, there's a, we generate from those um, output files, we generate this text file, which is what the input for um, Doigen expects to see. Uh, it, and then, and it, so this is essentially looking at the root mean square error at each of these locations. So in our input for this, we have an expected thickness. That's this value here, this expected, where are we? Let me just check. Truth, here we go. So that we have our truth values and our experiment 
values here and some standard deviations as well. So what we're looking at here is the root mean square error at each of these well locations. So we're only looking at the thickness here. So what we're looking for is the lowest, the lowest error between the expected thickness and our experiment thickness. Uh, this is just a really simple output where all it shows is just these listed values uh, in order of, um, of, of error. And we can see here that we have the precipitation, the erodibility, our parameter values that give us this low error at this data set here or at our, at our points in these locations. And these are the a, a couple of, a few images just showing the distribution of the thickness in the um, in our design parameters experiment outputs. So that the next thing is that we need to look at our plots for these results, uh, the evaluations of those results. And this is just a bit of an example over of, of a typical plot from how we start digging into these results. Um, this plot on the left is a pair level parameter plot. And what it's looking at is those design level pairs and their relationship to our final thickness. So you can see here we have these, our scale bar here goes from yellow is 200 and this dark blue is essentially zero. So the darker values are where we have a strong match with the expected thickness. And we can already start to see a, a really strong correlation here. So this, this low erodibility value in this column here is having trouble filling, supplying enough sediment to meet the thickness that's that we look we're getting, we're expecting in our in our experiments at that at our well locations. We can also see this two tectonic event scenario through here has a strong correlation with this darker blue color. So it's it's showing pretty consistently that we are getting a good match between that that two tectonic scenario and a well location, uh, uh, our, our expected results. So we're already getting these two really useful indicators about the parameters that we've input. They're, some, they're kind of giving us this, this uh, pointing us towards an answer. Um, we're also, we can also see this, this sort of gradual increase through here with our M and N ratio. So to some degree, this M and N ratio is offsetting the, uh, is is operating in an opposite direction to the to our erodibility, and we can also see that where we combine this two tectonic event and our erodibility, that the erodibility is is a dominant factor in the, in this as well. So there's quite a lot of information we can pull out of these plots. Um, DOEVAL, which is that evaluation module in DOEGEN, also produces these, uh, I, I call them tornado plots, but they're sort of a, a bar chart as well. And it's it's really useful to give you this indication of, you know, what are the important processes uh, contributing to those, those, the range in the thickness that we're seeing. And you can, you can see here that this two tectonic event has a, a big difference in, you know, has a, a range in, a big contribution to the thickness range. Um, whereas the erodibility Thickness changes aren't, aren't very much through the are, are fairly similar with between the the n ratio and the um, the n uh, precipitation doesn't seem to have a huge effect. Um, we can also take the data out of the tables that produces these things and start looking at at subdividing these things into different plots as well. So we can we can start to look at these things and say, look, this this low RMSE event, it's obviously in this two tectonic scenario. Uh, place. Um, so that, that's kind of this, this area around here on this plot. We've also got another set of parameters that sort of sit through here in, in this type, type of scenario through there. So you can dig into those and see what, what those parameters may be. Uh, and then we have this really far field effect out here, which is kind of this, this last end result there, which is just the, the largest difference between them. Um, I'd like to dig a little bit further into these DOE plots, the pair variant plot, because they really tell us an interesting story and give us an idea of the usefulness of value of evaluating those parameter level pairs. I've changed the color bar to try and just see a little bit more detail in this case, but I, I don't think it's useful to do this on, on you know, ongoing. 
Um, so the basics example, which is our 40, 48 experiment, runs reasonably quickly. And, and the basin example that we use is also, it's possible to do a full factorial experiment on it. Uh, so you're you're looking at uh, you know is it do I do all of this um, you know this multivariable thing you know running 250 experiments or is 48 experiments enough? Uh, so you can still see this strong effect that we're getting for this M and N or this uh, our strong effect for our M and N ratio and our N value through here. Um, so those kind those things kind of offsetting the erosion. So that that's apparent in both plots possibly a little bit less in the 48 experiment. Um, is it countering E? So this is kind of a combined effect that we're measuring here. Uh, are we still seeing this three event scenario uh, or this two event or two tectonic event um, effect through there? Yes, it's it's a little bit more broken up, but look, it's still, it's still a strong result there. Um, but essentially, these other areas are just showing up as a sort of random blobs which aren't really telling us much at all so we're, we're just not and, and in this case all that's happening is that those 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 random that randomness is essentially cancelling itself out and to a large degree just ending up in the middle of this this color bar with perhaps some slight skewing so there's a little bit of information that you might be able to tease out of running a full factorial experiment over this but i'd argue that most of the value is is obtained from running this 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 much more efficient design. So that kind of rounds up that basin example, and I'd like to um, move on to the a sin rift example that I've I've been working on. Um, so this is the uh, based on the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous sequence of the Otway Basin. So for the initial topography here, I use a randomly generated and smoothed surface that's biased in a north-south direction. Um, this aligns with the underlying structural trend of the basement rocks. So this is just my, my surface topography that I start the, I initiate the, um, the model with. Uh, we don't have a, Jurassic topography to play with here. So it's just what what assumptions can we make about that that environment? And that's just one that I've chosen to make here. It's it's useful. Um, so the subsidence that we we, we uh, apply to the model is based on interpretations of the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous sequence in the crayfish subgroup. Um, and the experiment runs for 30 million years. Um, the subsidence is applied from five to 25 million years. And I've got two different tectonic scenarios that are only really slightly different. Um, one's got a, a constant rate of subsidence applied over that five to 25 million year scenario. Um, the other is a slow, fast, slow subsidence scenario with a, a just an initial and a slowdown phase. Um, Next, we, we roll into this the design of experiment set up the same as we had with the uh, basin example. Um, so we have our precipitation where I've given it three possible parameters between one and a half and two meters. Uh, I should probably say now, look, I've, I've run this model before. I had Doigen, uh working, so I already had a, a reasonable idea about the parameters that worked in this, in this case. Um, I didn't have a really good handle on stratigraphy, and that's kind of what this is aimed at, at getting. So it's it's not necessarily a naive first um, pass through the experiment. So a full factorial in experiment in this case would, or a full factorial run would take 720 experiments. Um, the design of experiment process recommends this best experiment design size of 90. Um, and that's that's this place in the um in the plot here. It's I could have easily run one at, uh, was it 72? And potentially had very similar results, but uh, I chose to run 90. It wasn't that much, that much extra effort in this case. Uh, once again, I run through this Doigen and the, the tool set workflow. Um, so we look at this orthogonal balanced experiments design table, we generate our XML, we run our Badlands experiments in parallel, and then we extract our well our data from the well locations in the Badlands experiments. 
there's a slight change to this. So um, to the previous process where I actually about extract the data in the in its final stratigraphic position, but we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and these are the calibration well locations that I have. Um, one is based on a well, two are on the platform sections of uh, of the basin. So there's a couple of platforms in there that are slightly thinner, where we can penetrate a full sequence of the um, crayfish subgroup. Uh, and there's there's a couple of wells that have synthetic sections added to the bottom from interpreted seismic. Um, so these are, are more, uh, I guess, hypotheses that we're we're trying to test with these models and to see if these if if we can evaluate a stratigraphy that that kind of matches with those as well. Uh, so the the first problem that we have is if we just look at the at the thickness in these tests. Um, most of, of those have a thickness within 10% of those observed values that we want to calibrate against. Um, this is mostly because the measured values represent almost all the accommodation being filled. So there's no exit from the basin for oversupply of sediment. So these, these values for the experiments through here basically represent um, a, lo a, a lot of so oversupply of sediment, but also um, appropriate supply of sed sediment. To the to the basin. Um, if we examine the the pair variant plot for the RMSE values for this for these thicknesses, it's apparent that the undersupply scenarios that are available to examine are mostly in the low erosion erosion cases, and even those are fairly um, difficult to determine. There's there's not a lot of uh, I guess certainty that these are are not just random values in this case, but Given our previous results, it, it, it kind of suggests so that, that these low, this low value here is probably the result resulting in these values over here. Um, it wouldn't be if, if, if we go back and we look at our design tables, we can extract this information and see which ones these match up with. And I, I pretty much guarantee that's that's what happened, what's happening there. Um, so how do we rank the experiments in this example? Um, how, how do we work out if you know which are the ones that work and which ones that represent what we're you know what are we looking for? Um, so within the Badlands models, uh, we have these things that I've, I've been referring to as this proxy environment information. Uh, so the water depth or the lake attribute was added to the Badlands outputs in the latest version of Badlands. It's in that Docker container. It's the equivalent of uh, water depth in the depth centers where the sea level doesn't interact with landscape. Um, so there's a, a, a parameter called pit fill, essentially. So, uh, we also have you know, at our observational locations this gamma ray log. Um, so in this case, it's a useful proxy for water depth. Um, high values have been interpreted generally to, in, uh, to Correspond with an increase in water depth in this section. I, I wouldn't make this generalization usually, but it, it does seem to work quite well. Um, if this was to be used for other things, you might want to look a bit look look for a slightly different curve, or maybe just double check those values and perhaps do a bit of cleanup on it, sort of. But it's a nice, it's a useful way to start. Uh, so the first task that we've got to do as part of our workflow here is to take that lake level attribute which is only available in the surface output. So it's only available in a 2D output. Um, and we need to interpolate them onto their final stratigraphic position. And that's that's essentially what this little bit of code does. So this, um, this section through here is just to slice through the, the final volumetric um, Badlands model that's produced. And all that we do is we take this attribute from the, each of these surfaces at each of these time steps and extrapolate it onto this as an additional as an additional attribute, and we just rinse and repeat that for all of the models in our Badlands set. Uh, then, once we have that in its final depth location at all of those experiments, we extract that layer that property as a pseudo log file. So this is the same as the very similar to the thickness data that we looked at before, except we're extracting it at a depth at a layer. Um, and we also have a time for when that happened as well. Um, these are all output to these um, HDF files, uh, HDF5 file, and we've got a whole bunch of properties that are extracted at the same time. And so that we can plot these against um, depth and against uh, model time. 
And this is essentially the output that we get from these things. So we, we get these uh, lake level depth plots. And I'm just showing a few examples here, even though there are, in this case, there's a lot more for this, for this, for this output. Um, and this on our on our right hand side here, we have our, our gamma ray log. Now, this is just a little bit of code that does it. We just send it a um, uh, a, a few bits and pieces of, uh, of results, and it will plot these these things out here at this location. Um, so, after running this process, we end up with a whole pile of these these plots that kind of look like this. So we can we can look at these manually. Uh, and we, we could try and match, in this case, if you look very closely, that green gamma ray curve against the blue lake level curve. Uh, manually, just trying to you know eyeball the the best, the one that we think matches the best. Um, although this is uh, it's time consuming, it's it's inefficient, um, it, you know, it prone to some sort of observable bias. Uh, so in this experiment, we've got. 360 of these plots to evaluate. So is there an automated way to find a matching result for these? And there is. So uh, there's a whole bunch of um, curve matching algorithms and looking for curve similarity uh, out there in Python world. Um, so after a few tests, um, the one that kind of worked for me in this case is this discrete fresh A distance. Uh, it, examines, looks for the shortest path required to join two points traveling forward along those two paths. Um, it's defined as the shortest path to do, join those two points um, with no backtracking. So essentially, uh, the fresh A distance in this case will be this line here. So if I if I take that that point there, it's going to be the, the shortest distance that you can, you can sort of move forward along here through there. Um, so there are lots, if you've got something else you want to convert, com compare, there are some other tools, other curve matching tools that are in that um, I've implemented in the, the um, tool set. Uh, and, and that's entirely possible to do. So I, once we run that curve similarity process, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about how this all kind of works. So now we get to evaluate the results from these experiments. It's pretty early. Uh, results and the, and the matching could be improved with some tweaks potentially to the model and or, or to the algorithm that's used but i think it's really useful to have an early look at how this thing is working um, to match the stratigraphy and i think it's giving some really good results here so just a, a brief summary of the table that's output from one of these processes so we have this df which is our discrete fresh a distance um, there's also this thing called a directed hausdorff which is available in side by spatial uh, it gives very similar results as well. Um, I've implemented a flag here where I just throw this um, essentially a null value in where we have low thickness, um, uh, very low thickness wells. So wells that don't actually um, have that thick, thickness there to match that those locations. Um, so this is our discrete thickness and our our output values. So I just like to point out a couple of things in the um, in the plot here. We can see that the initial phase in our experiment design or our experiment in this deep basin here. So we th this is apparent both in the lithology and the stratigraphy is that we have these really deep lakes to start with, and the match between our gamma ray and our lake depth here is pretty good, uh, and we can see that both in time at this well location, or sorry, in depth at our well location, but also in model time. So um, this is actually a really useful result. So our, our biostratigraphy and, and the other dating measures that we have on this, uh, on this particular time period don't give us enough information to, to really put much constraint on this. There's sort of an upper and a lower limit. Um, but this is it's it's another time property that we can drag into here and it, it it's it's it kind of fits about with what people kind of estimate this how long it took for these lakes to form for the drainage system to align um, cannibalize and sort of start providing enough sediment to fill these things in uh we 
I've, I've interpreted this increased sediment supply scenario section here where it's still sort of, you know, fairly lacustrian, but you're getting these, these sort of fluvial inputs coming in, in through this phase through here. Um, there seems to be a blocky section that, that matches up fairly well across this section here in the um, both the lake level and the, the gamma ray. Uh, and then we have a much deeper or a much more lacustrine scenario coming up through here. So this is trending much deeper. It's, it's a generally poor correlation in this example. Uh, and I suspect this is because of some potentially complex and some far field effects that are that are coming through in this um, in this model. Uh, and that that's certainly something that I want to evaluate as we we move on I move on through the process of um, of ex examining these models. Uh, so on the right hand side, I've just wanted to show a couple of examples of of some outliers. So in this case, this is one where we don't have enough sediment to fill to fill the um, basin at this in, at this well location. So this starts at minus eight hundred to minus twelve hundred. So we're essentially about eight hundred meters less sediment here than we need. Um, this particular value might show a, a, a match if we would not have this flagged uh, in the in the scenario and and you, as, as essentially pre-filtered out. Uh, we can also look at this this case here where we have what I've interpreted to be a high sediment supply. Um, at this location, and you can see that this initial lacustrine environment just immediate, almost immediately gets filled. It, it doesn't have time to sort of build those lakes that you, you're seeing in these uh, in that early level, and then it pretty much stays very shallow all the way through, with kind of you know shallowing, getting a little bit deeper further on. Uh, so erosion is essentially keeping pace with um, well, sediment supply with with accommodation in this uh, in this basin in this location. Um, I'd like to move on to a little bit more evaluation uh, about this particular, you know, how this, what this tells us about the Otway Basin at this time. Um, so it, it suggests that sediment supply was coming from the east and th those troughs are filled first with the overflow sediment being transported further to the west. So the west is over onto the right hand side of here. Um, so that initial deep lacustrine environment is extensive across most of the early troughs that are representing that sequence before the drainage systems are realigned or cannibalized. Um, the smaller troughs in the east are likely to have a much higher su sediment supply to accommodation ratio. So, um, you know, there, there's usually enough to fill this without forming any really interesting lacustrine uh, versus uh, non lacustrine stratigraphies. Um, and while it's a, a relatively high slopes along these basin edges persist throughout the experiment, near the depot center, the erosion may be being shielded there by that sediment source that's produced distally. So this is sort of talking about later in the model about why we're, we're getting more, more, um, more lacustrine facies here is that the sediment may be being transported from further away from these, these steeper sections along the the edge of that erosion front that's kind of moving across the landscape. Uh, so it's possibly a, a, another time here where we can go back to the selection about our well location. So you can, you could, if I was to um, put a calibration well through here, this is that concept where I'm not really getting a lot of variation between lake level and um, sediment to, to really tell me what's going on to, to calibrate against. Um, and so you, you're kind of looking at these platform locations, which seem to provide the best match, uh, and and potentially these deeper sections where you're getting these these nice thick sequences to to try and calibrate against if you've got data over those. Um, so um, I think just there's there's much more work that you'd need to do to try and build a, a lithological model out of this this sort of information. Uh, so it's just just a bit of a proviso there. These are these are really early sort of um, stages, and, and I've got a lot of work to do from here. Uh, but in terms of calibrating our data to the landscape, I'd just like to say that you know these and the assumptions that we've made in constructing our initial surfaces and the area of of the model, it's suggesting that we're that that these are these are appropriate. So the erosion and transport and 
erosion transport and the, the deposition is taking place entirely within the model space. So I, I don't have erosion sort of hitting at the edge of this. So that kind of tells me that I'm, I'm hitting in the right track. Um, I'm generating a useful stratigraphy that I'm able to evaluate. And to get to that useful stratigraphy, I don't need to invoke any unusual tectonic or clima climatic events. Um, I think this is this is key, and it's it's something that's uh, I'm, I'm kind of heading towards as being something really interesting to look at um, compared to some previous work that's been done. So I, I guess I'll wrap it up here. Um, just conclude by saying that the large amount of information that is generated um, by running multiple models really requires automated tools to analyze the results. Um, the Badlands DOE toolset helps generate a simple reproducible workflow and it automates this analysis combined with Dogen to help evaluate, evaluate the effects of those parameter changes. Uh, and, and I want to probably you know repeat again that you know evaluating these parameters effectively and efficiently using these statistically relevant methods um, is just key to, to building really good badlands models. Okay, um, I guess once again, thanks to everyone for coming today. Uh, and I'll probably wrap that up here.